and we'll be able to get started. It is the top of the hour. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host today, Illinois Extension's Todd Gleason. This is our Coronavirus and Ag webinar series. Uh, today, we'll be talking about attempting an outlook of the policy landscape. Of course, as the summer uh, approaches, uh, it's in the coronavirus pandemic has gotten a bit worse. And the economic outlook, well, it's dimmed some. Uh, Congress is attempting to negotiate a potential round of relief for the coronavirus pandemic with about, uh, about that 2020 election is already in place and we're working with that. The webinar, of course, today will review the policies that have been put in place to date, uh, to date and will attempt to take a quick look, at least uh, our panelist will, uh, ahead. The webinar will look at how MFP, CFAP, and other ad hoc relief can serve as uh, a leading indicator uh, to the policy directions that may come in the future. Uh, take some time now to welcome Jonathan Coppice and Nick Paulson. Both are uh, here on the Urbana-Champaign campus and will guide us through the day. I don't know which of the two of you are going to start today, but Thank you so much uh, for being with us, Nick and Jonathan. Thanks, Todd. I, so I think I was going to kick things off um, just on this uh, first slide here. We wanted to remind everybody about some some upcoming dates, uh, deadlines, uh, and, and some things um, for, I guess, some of the ongoing um, programs that we have. So uh, the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program or the CFAP program, they did uh, extend that deadline a bit to submit an application for CFAP payments. Um, originally, the, the deadline was August 28th. They have extended that now to Friday, uh, September 11th, um, 2020. Um, other point we wanted to make today was, uh, as we get started here, was to remind everybody about uh, the WIP Plus uh, program, some of the additional uh, disaster relief that, that was um, uh, uh, provided for, for some of the uh, drought and in Illinois, the uh, very wet weather uh, damages associated with, with all the prevent plants um, in 2019. That sign-up period um, has been open in, in March, uh, has been open since March um, and remains open. And I, I don't believe USDA has, has yet set a, uh, a deadline or a, a closing day on that program yet, but that's uh, another thing uh, if there's questions on that, maybe we can address those in the in the try to address those in the question and answer session. Um, and then, you know, on the ARC and PLC program, uh, again, just remind everybody kind of on the on the timing of that. Um, we're still in the marketing year for 2019 for at least uh, what 10, 10, 12 more days here, um, 13 more days, I guess. Um, our, our marketing year ends August 31st. Um, so those prices, um, at least for corn and soybeans, will be finalized here at the end of August. Uh, still waiting on FSA to release the, the yields, the official yields used for the ARC program, ARC County program. Um, and then payments uh, for those programs uh, should, be, should be then going out here um, you know, after October 1st. And those, again, are for the, for the 2019 crop year, even though we're in the um, you know, heading into into fall of 2020. Um, we on Farm Doc we had written. Um, you know, Gary had, had led an article. Gary Schnicki had led an article on estimated ARC and PLC payments uh, for 2019. Um, wanted to remind everybody about the uh, the, the the tool uh, that we have and our partnership with the uh, National uh, Supercomputer Center on 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 campus here. Um, we've got the tool that estimates those things. Uh, that is set up now with with new price scenarios. Um, I think those were updated back in June. Uh, they have changed a bit. Uh, if you remember some of our payment estimates from from late winter, early spring this year, uh, in general, prices have have come down with with uh, the effects of COVID. Um, and so we'd be looking at you know potentially larger payments for for all the programs um, across the the three crops that we typically uh, focus on here in the Midwest, corn, soybeans, and wheat. Um, and so you might want to check out what some of those updates are. But again, those payments will be calculated and, and rolling out here um, uh, come come early October. Um, with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Jonathan and, and uh, he, can, he can take you through the next couple of slides. 
Thanks, Nick. And uh, just to follow up real quick on your point about the uh, Gardner FarmDoc ARC PLC payment tool, we will also be updating that with prices, final NYA prices, and the yield information when FSA releases it. So something else to keep an eye out for uh, as we move into the October payment stretch. So <clears throat> uh, we are in the uh, uh, position of trying to peer into the future on what farm policy uh, may look like coming down the road. Obviously, a massive amount of uncertainty, and uh, this comes with all caveats about <laughs> not being able to know where we're headed. But let's look at where we sit uh, right now in terms of assistance. Uh, the CARES Act that Congress enacted back uh, towards the end of March um, had two trillion dollars. Uh, within that was about nine and a half billion specifically for uh, assistance payments through USDA. Um, and that is part of what's feeding the funds for the CFAP program that Nick mentioned sign up deadline is approaching on September the 11th. So we had that CARES Act uh, at the end of March. The House followed that up uh, just a few weeks later with its HEROES Act. Uh, that provided an additional round, or that proposed, if you will, an additional $3 trillion uh, in assistance to help with the COVID uh, pandemic. And if we jump ahead uh, time-wise, um, Senate Republicans uh, released their proposed package, although it's not a final legislative uh, uh, bill at this point. They released that at the end of July with about a trillion dollars uh, in spending. Go ahead and keep advancing through. Um, and so right now, uh, if you followed any of this, you know that the negotiations between the House, uh, the Senate, and uh, the White House have broken down completely or as near completely as we, uh, as we can understand it. Um, the Senate is currently in its August recess, um, so that limits uh, any further negotiations at this point, although the House uh, just announced that they will be returning later this week. Um, but largely to focus on the concerns around the, the U.S. Postal Service, uh, the changes that have been uh, pushed through the Postal Service that have raised concerns about mail delivery, timeliness, and then obviously the impacts that might have on voting and, and potential mail-in ballots. So not sure that that uh, controversy will help advance negotiations any further, but uh, it is something to watch out for because we will have members, we will have the House back in session. So that may help uh, may help uh, motivate some additional negotiations. So if we look at why we're stuck or what we're stuck on, this is a, an attempt to just roughly summarize the positions uh, between the two parties, the Republicans uh, led by the Senate and the, and the administration versus the Democrats uh, led by the House. Uh, based on the, the proposals or the bills out, we're about $2 trillion uh, in difference, a $3 trillion uh, House proposal to a $1 trillion uh, Senate proposal, although there's been in some indications that both sides have have narrowed that spread. Um, and so we may not be just at these top line numbers, and we've seen some of that come down. The bigger issues around some of the specifics, in particular, this supplemental unemployment insurance program that uh, was, was uh, part of the CARES Act that provided $600 in, in supplemental unemployment insurance per week to help those who lost their jobs. And so the House wanted to continue it. Uh, the Senate and the administration have, have at least initially indicated they wanted to cut that way back to about $200. Uh, then, then President Trump uh, took executive order or put in place executive orders that there's still a lot of question about whether they're operational and even legal, but that may put this in another $300 range. So we're, we're obviously very much in flux on the supplemental unemployment. Uh, the uh, Senate Republicans in particular want uh, liability shield for employers um, for, for uh, potential exposure to lawsuits for, uh, for spreading coronavirus in the workplace. And then there was at least some initial discussion about school funding being tied to reopening. Uh, given what we're seeing right now, um, that likely is no longer a big issue or will fade pretty quickly. On the House Democratic side, there was a trillion dollars in assistance state and local governments, which have been hammered hard by the, uh, the economic downturn uh, and the loss of revenue. And then the Postal Service issue uh, and uh, additional funding for both the post office, but also to help uh, address some of the additional costs for what is expected to be the largest mail-in balloting, uh, mail-in voting uh, that we've seen in history. And then, you know, 
the most specific uh, farm bill realm it would be around in, the house proposal increased SNAP spending. So this is just a rough overview of where where they're stuck in the negotiations. Um, I, I wish I had uh, some great insight into you know which parts of these are a deal in the making and which are uh, kind of non-starters or absolute hurdles to a deal. Um, but right now we we are in as uh, as problematic. You know, if you go back and think about how the optimism we had in March when Congress quickly reacted and quickly put something together, we're in the exact opposite space with uh, concerns about Congress being able to to reach an agreement. Um, at this point in time, it does not look like it's going to happen during the recess. If we dig deeper into the CFAT program, um, if you have not looked at it, uh, USDA's farmers.gov website has a phenomenal dashboard on the CFAT program, the payments that are out, approved applications. You see a screenshot of that the, that I took yesterday, uh, running us up through uh, this week um, in its payments. And you can see Illinois down there at about $438 million in payments. Iowa is uh, outpacing us. In total payments, and there in the in the bottom corner, you can see uh, by commodity. So we've got about nine billion of that that has been paid out thus far uh, in the CFAT program. If you recall, and you can jump to the next screen. If you recall, the uh, the overall program was at least estimated back in May to spend about sixteen billion dollars in payments. So we're roughly at fifty six percent of that overall. If you look across, uh, that, that same estimate had a commodity by commodity estimate of what they thought the payments would be. And you can see corn, soybeans, cotton, dairy, and hogs all below where those estimates were. Uh, cattle, on the other hand, have, have exceeded what they thought would be spent on those programs. A lot of questions on why that is the case. Um, you know, there, are, there were concerns initially that we raised and, and discussed uh, about this use of uh, this, this uh, unpriced inventory. And so it's possible that that could be one of the bigger issues limiting payments right now to farmers because of that requirement in which USDA uh, created this, this term of unpriced inventory based on what was sitting in storage and not under contract. Um, more analysis is going to be needed to figure out exactly what's what's holding up the payments. If we look specifically uh, at Illinois, this also from the dashboard, um, you can see the, 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 the breakdown of payments in Illinois were non-special crops, corn and soybeans leading the way uh, in total payments. Go ahead and jump to the next one. And with this, Nick, I believe I hand it back over to you. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, guys. Jonathan. Um, so, you know, I think in the next three slides, um, some, some points here that we'd, we'd like to highlight um, based on some of the more detailed work we've done in, in some FarmDoc Daily articles um, here over the, the past few months this summer. Um, so in this first figure, um, we're just looking at uh, the, the black line gives you a, a feel for the annual outlays on total um, direct payments made to, to farmers from the federal government. Um, so you can see here that we've got some, you know, some variability in that, you know, depending on, you know, the economic um, environment uh, and, uh, and, 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 what, and things that are going on in, in the industry uh, by year. Um, you know, but the, the one thing that jumps out is just the uh, very significant amount of uh, federal direct payments that have gone out uh, the increasing level and and just the overall level of payments that we've seen in 2018, 2019, and 2020. So, you know, 2018 and 2019, um, the the payments from the first round of the market facilitation program were split across those two years. Uh, round two of MFP uh, came in in 2019 with with some of that support spilling into 2020, and then as as Jonathan was just discussing, we have the CFAP program. Um, in response to uh, the coronavirus um, in in 2020, and then you know potentially even more, um, you know again uh, referring to what Jonathan was talking about and, and what's currently being negotiated by uh, Congress and the administration in another uh, potential stimulus um, package here that that we're looking at that could be passed um, this fall and, and provide some support still this year. Um, the other thing to to point out in this chart. Um, again, just kind of for some historical perspective and, and just to really emphasize kind of 
you know, we're, we're in a pretty significant era here um, in terms of the, the, the way in which the government has been providing support to the industry. Um, split out programs that we refer to as ad hoc, um, meaning that they were kind of temporary in nature and passed be, uh, because of, uh, you know, in response to some you know, extraordinary events that were taking place. Um, this includes the MFP and CFAP programs over the past three years. Um, and in terms of total support, you know, close to you know, over 50, over 40 percent of total federal payments in 2018 were associated with MFP. And then in 19 and what we're looking at projected for 2020, um, you know, the lion's share, 70 percent of total um, direct payments from the, from the government to farmers um, coming from these these ad hoc style programs. You know, and and I remember um, it was it was quite a bit younger back then. But I remember the late '90s, early 2000s was kind of the last time we had you know significant consecutive years of of ad hoc payments, um, and and they were quite large in that in that time frame. But um, you know, uh, much smaller than what we've seen in the last three years, both in terms of uh, total dollars and and relative share of of total payments. Um, coming from ad hoc programs during during that late '90s, early 2000s era. Um, you know, kind of the the second point I wanted to kind of highlight again and, and bring up this morning, based on some work we've done, um, is you know how these ad hoc payments have kind of fit into the overall return and income picture. So here we're looking at um, data that's specific to Illinois. Uh, the farms enrolled in the um, Farm Business Farm Management Association here in Illinois. Um, and what we've got plotted here is, is operator and land returns. So that would be the return available to cover land costs, um, as well as, you know, hopefully a, uh, uh, some profit for the operator, um, along with, um, average cash rents, uh, for, for farms in the FBFM association, um, over time going back to 2000. Um, and you can see since 2014, probably the first point here is that, you know, we've been roughly on average around kind of break even return levels. Once we incorporate um, uh, some of the federal support that, that goes into that operator and land return, um, kind of similar to what we were experiencing um, in the in the late 90s, early 2000s uh, shown on this chart. Um, but, you know, what we want to highlight is just the extraordinarily important role of these ad hoc um, payments that have been received in, in 18, 19 and what we're expecting uh, to, to, to still receive in, in 2020 in terms of kind of, you know, creating that, that, that break even scenario. So MFP in, in 18 and 19. Um, MFP and CFAP in, in 20, and then we're even, you know, expecting some additional aid in 2020 that's been built in here that's 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 giving us those break-even returns. Um, you know, I think that's, you know, I, I think most economists would agree that's that's probably relieved some some of the downward pressure we might exceed we might expect to see without these ad hoc payments um, in terms of production costs, whether that be on the land cost side uh, through cash rents. Or whether that be through through non-land costs um, and, and farmers having to make some adjustments there, um, and so you know, looking ahead to 2020 or 2021 is is where you know I think our you know, short-term concerns lie at this point. Um, you know, there is no um, ad hoc aid you know guaranteed even for the rest of 2020, let alone 2021. Uh, your guess is as good as ours. What the uh, what the election results in November will imply for expectations associated with continued aid to agriculture next year. Um, but it's pretty clear that given where we're at with prices, uh, USDA's most recent estimate for the 2020-2021 marketing year average price for corn is 310, 835 on soybeans. Um, you know, in the absence of some additional um, ad hoc style aid in 2021, we're looking at, you know, on average, some pretty significant negative returns or returns that are not going to be sufficient to cover, um, you know, average land costs given given where they're currently at. Um, and then finally, um, wanted to, before I turn it back over to Jonathan, wanted to highlight some points brought up in a really interesting article um, that was led by Carl Zuloff, uh, recently published on Farm Doc Daily, and just kind of looking historically um, over the past 40 years, 
of some of the eras where we've seen pretty significant ad hoc aid and what that's meant in the in the years uh, following um, when that that ad hoc aid was provided. So uh, in that article, Carl highlights um, the PIC program um, in the early to mid 80s and how that kind of rolled into a, a period of increased uh, federal support to agriculture that was that was built into the, the, the farm bills kind of immediately following um, that PIC program. Uh, then again, the late 90s, early 2000s, I talked about with the market loss payments um, kind of leading into, um, again, a higher extended period of, of, of federal aid. Um, and then, you know, that again, that that provides some insight potentially into what we might expect, um, you know, leading into the next three or four years, um, you know, adjustments to farm bill programs, what we might expect in the next farm bill. Uh, continuation of ad hoc aid, just given the the big run up that we've seen um, to help offset some of the losses just over the past um, past three years. Now, you know, all eras are different, and there's there's a lot of complexities that go into the politics and and the the budget side of things on these issues that 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 Jonathan could probably speak more to if we've got uh, questions about this, but. Um, again, it's, it seems at least, you know, over the last 40 years, there've been kind of multiple occurrences of this increase in ad hoc aid, and then that leading into kind of extended periods of, of increased um, uh, support payments to farmers. Uh, so this ad hoc aid kind of being a leading indicator for where we might be um, at in the next, uh, in the next three to four year period. Um, with that, I'm going to let Jonathan take over here and, and, uh, kind of make some of our, uh, our our final points before we get into the questions. Thank you, Nick. And I got to say, uh, I mean, every conversation I've ever had with Carl is thought provoking. And that article and that chart that we just saw, I got to, I just got to give him credit because that thing has been rattling around in my head uh, ever since he first ran the draft bias. And it really, I mean, we could, spend a lot of time trying to think through, you know, the differences, the 83 pick program was administered, was created by USDA under existing authority, similar to how MFP was today compared to the late nineties, which were congressionally authorized appropriated ad hoc programs and how those things funneled differently into the policy process or what they signal. I, I, I encourage anybody who wants to think this through, um, to read that article and, and, and join me in trying to, uh, make sense of the future out of it. So it's, it's just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal article. But uh, anyway, enough, uh, enough of that. Let me, let's try to, let's try to pull this into where we may be headed. And then this kind of just teases us up for the question and answer session of, of this. So as Nick was pointing out, as we pointed out, we've, we've got kind of a, a, a mixture of the ad hoc nature of programs. The administration created MFP. Uh, Congress then is sort of, uh, provided an initial uh, flow of funds for the CFAT program, which it was the administration then stood up. And then we're now in this sort of stalemate, negotiating stalemate uh, over what the next round looks like. So what we've got is a couple things to kind of break down in this. If we look closely at the House Heroes Act, they've got $16.5 billion slated in there for direct payments to producers roughly around 85% of the second quarter losses uh, for uh, everybody. If, if a crop wasn't in the CFAT program in that first round, that 85% I think spreads from the first and second quarter. So they're basically uh, adding another round of CFAP uh, on that. There's also a notable uh, re renewable fuel uh, reimbursement about 45 cents a gallon. So here's the, uh, the direct assistance, to the ethanol industry for the, massive amount of damage they've they've uh, suffered during this COVID crisis. There is a, then there's also uh, funding in there for livestock and dairy. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the increase in SNAP um, benefits, which basically uh, looks a lot like what, what Congress did in 2008, 2009, during the Great Recession, when there was a temporary booster to the SNAP benefits, uh, given the state of the economic downturn. Um, and, and again, I've sort of made this point many times that uh, regardless of anybody's pre-position or pre-political ideological perspective on SNAP, um, I, I just have a hard time understanding 
any resistance to helping people eat during a massive uh, health and economic crisis combined. And so I, I think in general, increasing SNAP is, is very, uh, very beneficial. And I think from a farm bill perspective, uh, this is one of those areas where we've learned painfully in 2014 and 18 that fighting over SNAP does not help get a farm bill done. In fact, it usually uh, puts the farm bill in, in, in significant jeopardy. So maybe we see some movement there that would be helpful. Uh, there's also a really interesting piece in the House Heroes Act um, that we don't have a lot of detail around yet is this in emergency soil health and income protection pilot. And so uh, the first indicators of maybe some conservation-based assistance to help out, uh, 5 million acre cap, an annual rental payment up to $70 an acre. There's some, some cost share on uh, the establishment side, mostly around cover cropping and, uh, and, and putting some cover on acreage. Interesting to see if this gets any traction. Um, it also feeds into a lot of the questions we've had around, you know, reevaluating uh, set aside and acreage uh, based policies. So whether this is maybe another one of those little indicators that we that we see of, of a potential trend. And then on the Senate side, uh, we don't have uh, anything official, but mostly what's been reported is uh, an increase in the CCC uh, reimbursement by $20 billion. And so if you've set through any of the CCC discussions, I think you you understand uh, the basics. It, it operates as a $30 billion line of credit uh, at, the, at the use of, of USDA based on the 1948 eight Charter Act uh, authorities. And so USDA creates, uh, can use that uh, creatively, which they did with MFP. And then Congress has to reimburse what we call net realized losses, which is effectively just the spending uh, on that line of credit. The CARES Act reimbursed 14 billion, but it delayed that reimbursement until the end of, Ju of June. So that has kicked in. Uh, so we can probably guess that that uh, that what is left on the CCC credit line of credit is is around that 10 to 14 billion range, depending on what has been spent uh, in in total uh, under the CFAP as well as the other obligations for the CCC. Remember it. it it's the line of funding that pays for ARC and PLC programs, that pays for conservation programs, that pays, that, that uh, loans out the money for the marketing assistant loan, export assistance and so forth. So the CCC is used by a broad uh, spectrum of programs. And so there's a lot of obligations that, that go through that line of credit during any fiscal year. And so Congress reimburses it um, uh, to keep it operational. If the Senate provision is accurate and goes through, then we'd see that uh, reimbursement uh, of $20 billion, which could probably get us uh, back around the 30 billion cap overall um, of available funding then for USDA to use uh, in ad hoc assistance. And then the big question, and this is what we kind of leave off with is, or what we set up the, the, the question and answer session of this webinar is really, what is what is all this kind of leading to? So I, I, I refer again to Carl's article in the chart we looked at earlier. Uh, do we have leading indicators based on the ad hoc assistance that we've seen? Are we getting some indications of what, uh, what directions farm policy might take as between the negotiations here around uh, another round of, of COVID relief legislation? And how does this look? If we kind of stack these things up, we know that uh, the 2018 MFP was tied directly to actual production, actual uh, bushels produced or pounds produced in the 18 crop year. 2019 MFP was tied directly to acres planted. Um, and then the CFAT program introduced this sort of uh, odd, uh, uh, unpriced or uncontracted inventory. So we, we see, uh, some pretty clear uh, recoupling, at least in three different versions of recoupling of the of the uh, direct assistance to farmers around production. How much of that continues? Uh, we again, we have a potential conservation component, and a lot of questions around acreage policy. So one of the things it builds to uh, is: Are we also looking then at an early farm bill? Uh, this farm bill was created and it was passed and enacted in December of 2018 which happens to also be roughly the time that uh, the administration was creating the MFP program and the tariff conflict uh, was, was unfolding rapidly. So are we seeing uh, this kind of pressure maybe leading to an earlier farm bill? It's scheduled to expire in 2023. And, uh, you know, it, that's a big question. Uh, obviously, as, as Todd and Nick both uh, talked about, we are in um, 
the wonderful frenzy of the campaign season. And certainly um, a lot of this depends on how the elections play out, not just whether or not we'd have a new farm bill, but what kind of policy discussions we see and uh, how that might unfold politically uh, in Congress and with the administration. And you know, an early farm bill is likely me is likely uh, a signal that we're going to see adjustments in the programs, if not um, some pre wholesale changes potentially. And then whether we are in early farm bill mode, uh, continued ad hoc mode, or uh, you know, stick to the 2023 schedule, we have uh, continued to get in, an increasing level of questions and discussion around acreage policies, and in particular, something in the, in the vein of the old set-aside policies that were eliminated back in 1996 with decoupling in the, in the FAIR Act, um, and whether that is a policy option uh, for renewed discussion and consideration, or what that might look like updated uh, for what we call more modern times, whether that's a more modern uh, export and world market situation, or just the modern uh, um, set of challenges around COVID and, you know, sort of in the wake of the tariff conflict and what it means for a World Trade Organization and so forth. So there's a whole lot of questions, uh, regardless of when we, we see the next round of farm policy outside of the ad hoc and kind of emergency uh, standpoint. But I do think we can, we can certainly see uh, at least potential areas that we may be trending in. Some of them I think are more concerning than others. And so that's kind of where we may be headed or what we may be looking at. And then we, <laughs> we, uh, we welcome questions, thoughts, and uh, other ideas that uh, here for the next uh, 10, what, 20 minutes or so for this. So appreciate uh, everybody paying attention. Oh, and Todd, are you going to plug the next webinar? You Do I hand it over you? Thank you, there you so go. much. Of course, we've been talking or uh, listening to both Nick Paulson and Jonathan Compass, who you just heard. Uh, our upcoming webinars here with the FarmDoc team from the College of Aces on the University of Illinois campus include this Friday, Budgeting and Farm Income with Gary Schnitke and Dale Latz. And then on Tuesday of next week, the outlook of farmland prices and the evaluation of detriments of farmland, determinants rather, uh, of farmland. That will be with Nick Paulson, Bruce Sherrick, Gary Schnitke, and Dale Latz. We would like to take a moment too to thank our sponsors for the day. They include Compare Financial, TIAA, the Center for Farmland Research right here on the U of I campus, Farm Credit Illinois, Growmark, uh, and the Illinois Corn Growers Association, as well as the Department of ACE, Agricultural and Consumer Economics, who host the Farm Doc team and where the agricultural economists are housed here at the U of Y. So I think we'll begin uh, with a, a few of the questions. And we'll start with you, Nick. There was a question uh, about rental rates um, and, and uh, what farmland prices might look like in the future. Do you want to give a very short answer because you'll be taking this up uh, next week on Tuesday. Yeah, sure, Todd. Um, I'm also going to uh, try to turn our uh, webcams back on here for the. Um, sure. Give you guys you a warning. Turn, here. I can turn the webcams on. That's fine. I think. All right. So, um, and I'll uh, go ahead and take down the slides as well. All right. So. Um, yeah, I saw that question come in about um, land prices. Um, thanks for asking. I realize I is obviously very focused on cash rents there, and and not maybe um, considering the the cost to own land. Um, but I, you know, everything that we've seen, um, and again, there will be more information on that on the uh, on the uh, webinar next week. That's kind of devoted to that topic. But we've, you know. Perhaps so, somewhat surprisingly, I think for a lot of people, seen um, a lot of stability and, and continued strength in the uh, land value market. Um, you know, when it comes to land prices. So, uh, again, more more details on that in the in the webinar next week. And and both Bruce Sherrick and Gary Schnicki will you know have some 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 good insights on that. I think, but um, we've we've seen we've seen pretty stable land values as well as as rent levels. Do we know anything uh, about CFAP 2 um, or even round 2 of the first CFAP 
I think the round two should be coming pretty shortly. Did USDA announce that that would be dispersed? Are you referring to the fact that they had planned only 80% up front with a 20% second Correct. round? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have not heard specifically. Um, again, they, what, if you recall what they had said under CFAP is because they had a, they had a limited pot of money that they were blending what was remaining of the CCC line of credit with the 9.5 billion under the CARES Act. So they were, you know, kind of having to maneuver across those funding lines or those lines of, of credit. And so what they had said was they would, they would hold back 20% of any payment due to ensure that, that, that they didn't cross their, their full uh, amount. Based on what we're seeing now, we're roughly 56% of their estimated spending, it should be uh, that that extra 20% will come through because sh there should be plenty of funding under that, all of which would be even less of a concern if Congress actually uh, included more funding or more of a reimbursement to the CCC. So I haven't seen it scheduled yet. I presume they would wait until the sign-up is completed so they have a, they know exactly what the universe of payments are so then you could uh, be certain that you don't cross your uh, what you're allowed to spend and I've, I've heard I've heard county offices have kind of unofficially told told folks that that the twenty percent's coming they'll they'll get the full they'll get the full payment so I, I, won't sing, I won't single any counties out. They may not even be in Illinois, um, <laughs> where, where I've heard that. But I've, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard things from people. So <laughs> I've heard things people from people. That, yeah, people are saying very nice. Uh, I, I think I've heard that before. Any any thought about a second CFAP program? Well, that is uh, that's where I think we see our congressional negotiations as the main. Uh, catalyst for any additional. I, I, with one one thing I need to clarify, I had mentioned that we have the $14 billion reimbursement that should have gone into the CCC. I do not know how much of that would be available if, the, if let's say, uh, you know, really bad case scenario that Congress cannot reach a, an agreement at all on another round. So obviously, if Congress uh, Either it increases the reimbursement like the Senate has, has reportedly proposed or plugs in another $16, $20 billion in spending for uh, assistance, then absolutely you will see that uh, turn back around into another type of program. Then it's really a question of how that program looks and the timing. Uh, you can insert your political commentary on timing here uh, with the November election. The uh, without a congressional agreement, then we are we are in a position of uh, of USDA dealing with whatever remains of the 9.5 that was under the CARES Act, and whatever reimbursement, uh, whatever's left under the CCC reimbursement. In other words, uh, I would bet on there likely being some other kind of payment uh, at this point in time. It's really a question of the size of that payment, how much money USDA has available to work with. And then that will drive the design of the payment, what kind of restrictions. Again, I think that unpriced inventory concept that was in CFAP round one um, clearly was driven by, you know, trying to limit the spending and trying to target it to uh, what they saw as, as the, the, the risk that, that farmers are facing. So what this would look like is really going to be dependent on what the funds are, are available. Oh, sure. and, and I I would I would add to that too. I, I don't remember if I made this point as clear as I should have, but when we looked at that returns chart, um, along with the cash rents, um, you know, that is something where we did build in an expectation for more in more aid in twenty twenty than actually has been approved and received to this point. So um, I think the assumption that, that, that Gary and, and, and we've used in those return estimates for, for the current year is, is to basically assume the, the aid received, the total aid received in this year, stuff that still hasn't been legislated and approved yet, um, would be similar to what was received in, in 2019 just from, just from MFP2. So, you know, if, if negotiations continue to stall and we don't see another round of, of, of support from another stimulus, then 
you know, even that, even those 2020 returns are going to be well below where we see land costs um, on the cash rent side of things for this year. Is there any concern about running uh, into problems with the WTO on the kinds of payments that have been made or may be made in the future? I, without delving into the wonderful uh, specifics of the WTO and the amber, green, and I forget the other box now, uh, I think red <laughs> Sorry. i think uh look i think the reality is that given covid and its worldwide impact i i have a hard time imagining there is a wto problem around that but that could also depend on just what the size of the payments are and how they're designed um i mean clearly what we've been doing with mfp and even cfap those would are not within our agreement under under the WTO. I mean, these are, these would be payments that would be problematic in any normal situation. We're far from a normal situation, and I think there's a chance that uh, even the MFP challenges that could have been uh, forthcoming are less likely, right? In 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 the wake of of this. Um, but again, uh, you know. With the, with the way the Brazilian case, the, the precedent the Brazilian case sets against cotton from the late 90s, ad, and remember, that, that was pegged not just the 2002 Farm Bill, but the late 90s ad hoc payments that cotton received as well. Uh, the Step 2 program that was recreated, all of that. So that precedent still uh, exists under WTO, and we lost completely uh, across the board, right? The U.S. did not... Um, did not have a leg to stand on really in that in that situation. So I, I, I don't want to sound nonchalant. I don't want to make it sound like you know, this, this is not a problem. I think COVID and its worldwide impact really alters that calculation uh, in general. But that risk still sits out there, and I think much depends on both the size of the payments that would come out and how they're designed. Because we have reattached these payments directly to production, and that is as trade distorting. I think second only to export subsidies. Nick, you might have a better sense on the WTO specifics. No, not you know nothing beyond what you what you said. Although um, I will I will say we've got a few FSA employees uh, chiming in here, which is is great that they uh, can help us answer questions. But the twenty percent CFAP payment has been uh, has been released to county offices, um, according to our sources here and. Um, being processed and, and and sent out to those that that filled out their applications. So yeah, I was pretty certain that I had saw a news release on that last week at some point, and that it was coming as well. And of course, you read um, from our list our listeners and viewers that that is the case. Uh, I do have a question here about how much of the farm policy trends you've mentioned today will be impacted in twenty twenty one by the administration and the Secretary of Ag. So the kinds of policies you talk about, how, how do they make their way through DC and who controls? It's difficult to say who controls the purse strings because those come out of Congress, but um, it is an allocation, right? And somebody else might be able to control how it's distributed. Well, Jonathan, I mean, I think that depends on. <laughs> this sounds like an election. Twenty twenty one is, uh, you know, who, who will be the secretary of ag in twenty twenty one, and and who will be the administration? Um, you know, it's, well, they asked that as a secondary backup question. If you read through it, Nick. So <laughs> any, any See, luckily, list? I don't have the advantage of being able to read the questions, so I I, I get oh, a fly blind on this a little bit. Um, I so. I'm going to go back. I'm going to be a broken record a little bit on some of this. And that is we have to factor in that this COVID mess has sort of upset, you know, all of our standard kind of understandings. So I wouldn't, um, I don't know how much the election will impact. It may impact you know, the way assistance is designed. I think Congress is going to have a much bigger say in that uh, going forward. I think, you know, based on past uh, experience, past uh, history, 
anytime the administration gets uh, super creative with the CCC, that garners a lot of attention from the appropriators in Congress. And previously, they have, on a bipartisan basis, uh, cracked down on creative uses of the CCC. The Trump administration has spent more out of the CCC than anybody else. So that kind of thing will certainly add a lot of attention from appropriators who have to figure out how to backfill that under the allocations they have. But again, uh, with the situation we're in, we're, we're under right now, um, you know, I don't know that all the, the usual kind of responses and rule, I don't want to say rules, I don't think all the usual sort of responses or positioning applies because we have just hit such an unusual uh, uh, situation. But, you know, some of the political realities continue. If we continue to see partisan fighting over SNAP, that's going to have an impact, uh, depending on who's in, who's in charge. Um, you know, there are arguments that, uh, that, that a new administration uh, would have a very different focus, potentially a different interest, but if the damage is still there, I've not known a USDA under any administration that didn't seek to, to provide assistance when there was loss and damage. So the Iowa situation, for example, with the Draco, Draco. Um, uh, so I, I think I think we can get a little too wrapped around that question. Um, at least from my perspective, I think the bigger question is is what kind of directions, not what directions could we take, but what should we uh, who you know the, the work on these? You know, what should, what should we be looking at, and how do we start thinking this through in a post COVID scenario, regardless? Um, of who's, who's at USDA. Nick, any questions there that you would look through that you want to answer? I, the, I think the, the follow-up to this one may be um, the lame duck session and whether that has some interesting out, interesting potential impacts based on who didn't get reelected and which lines they're willing to cross on the way out. Yeah. Or, again, it kind of depends on, uh, I mean, maybe some of your level of cynicism on the payments to date. Um, you know, is the political motivation there? Uh, you know, let's be honest. If Trump loses, how do they respond? I think there are also much bigger questions around, um, frankly, the allegations this president has made about vote fraud and things like that that I think are very destructive to our democracy and how does that play out that something about paying farmers and a lame duck may be a very minor issue. So I, I come back this time and again, we have to recognize in this discussion that we are not in anything resembling a normal time or where we have any sort of historical antecedent that we can pull from and say, Oh, look, well, we did this in 83 or we did this in 65 and this is how it look. I mean, this, this is different on many, many levels. Yeah, and uh, Todd, maybe just you know, we're approaching noon. Um, maybe one of the things we can we can um, spend the last few minutes on is um, a few questions related to supply management or, or set aside. Uh, it was a point we had in our in our final slide. Um, it's it's you know, supply management slash set aside policies or something that. I think we've we've seen more people uh, discussing bringing up um, in in the current climate. Um, Jonathan and I and 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 Carl Zuloff and Krista Swanson and Gary Schnecki have written a series of what four or five articles now, kind of um, providing some background and historical context on the the U.S.'s dabbling in in supply management and, and set aside programs. Um, and uh, you know, based on the the data and the trends in, in global grain and oilseed production, um, I think our our opinion is is uh, you know these are things we should we should probably stay away from. Uh, that's probably come through in the articles that we've written. Um, not everybody agrees with that, um, but you know, I, I think our main main thesis is that you know, relative to when those programs have been used in the past, the U.S. role. Um, in terms of uh, being a global supplier of these commodities has, has, has only declined. Um, 
And so the potential impact that supply management could have given the position that some of our global competitors are in to, to fill those gaps and, and respond, even if we're, we're limit, limiting acreage or, or, you know, some of the other commodities that are produced here. Um, you know, I think historically supply management tactics have been less effective than intended. And, you know, I think our argument is that they would be even less effective today. Um, you know, if, if implemented in, in the way that they've been done historically. Now, there may be you know, different ways we can look at doing things like that, but um, we, we've, we've written pretty extensively on that in the last few months on, on FarmDoc as well. So I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Jonathan. Yeah, I think, so, uh, so the big if, right, I, I, is, is, is the clear point. How these things are designed matter which ones have worked and we've tried to compare like some of the older acreage adjustment policies with the pick kind of concepts that take acres out and and you know have the payment in kind system where you're getting bushels that were in for that have been forfeited to the USDA those are different type of programs but I think the thing that strikes me a lot in this conversation setting aside some of and, and your points I think have been well taken and Carl's points well taken these articles that look at the export market and the world trade scenario um, I'm struck by and maybe this is just my overly simple, simple look. I'm struck by the acreage, right? Each time we saw those policies enacted, we were in what could be determined, what could be called as an excess acreage situation where planted acres or acres of cropland used for crops were far in excess of what we are now. And that just strikes me that any policy seeking to take acres out of production is going to struggle with all the historical challenges we've seen, whether it actually impacts prices, whether we intensify production on the acres left behind, whether we seed those acres to export or foreign competitors. Now the question is, where are some of these acres coming from? Because even in this high demand, uh, the years of high demand with the RFS since 2005, we have not expanded to that. I mean, I, I go back to that spike in the 70s, the kind of acreage expansion we saw uh, post-Soviet uh, uh, grain deal in the 70s when uh, the Nixon administration was pushing expansion, Congress pushed expansion. And we just saw this massive spike of acres, which were then pulled back through PIC program in 83 and through the CRP and some of that. So we're not in that scenario. So I really sort of think that we would have, you know, to Nick's big if, I think we'd have to really rethink the way a, an acreage based policy would look based on what we currently have under production. And then we have all these other questions about intensity of production and export markets and foreign competitors and, and that. So. I, you know, I was pretty skeptical of this conversation. First time, first like eight times the question was asked. And, and then, you know, thick headed, it eventually kind of sort of uh, works its way uh, into your, into your brain, kind of an earworm situation maybe. And I think it, it really is raising some fascinating policy discussions about acreage, about some of these issues that um, actually has a, has a lot of value in, in sort of working out. Um, but I, but I, I think a blunt instrument thing like we've used in the past simply is not, not only not feasible, is, is, less, is likely to work even less well <laughs> than it did historically. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to read those articles, you can find them on the FarmDoc Daily website. They're really easy to get to. And there is a new search function there. You'll see the little spyglass up in the corner or search function. Just put supply management in. Uh, the first one that pops up, um, is uh, an article that you can read on supply management or all the way to the bottom. And I think there are two more articles linked there. My guess is once you start getting into the other, other articles, you'll see the rest of them linked at the bottom. So you start with supply management and the search function at FarmDoc Daily, and then uh, continue to roll all the way at the bottom after you read the articles and you'll find the other articles as well. Anything else before we go, Jonathan and Nick? Just to, just to add to that, Todd, if you're if you're looking for that specific series um, on on set aside programs, it, it's also you can also find them by going to the category tab and going to the Gardner um, Gardner series. Um, all of them were categorized as Gardner policy series posts, and you can you can get that as as well as a bunch of other reading on um, on farm policy analysis that we've that we've put out on on Farm Doc Daily. So, with that note. We'll wrap it up for the day. Thank you, Nick Paulson, and thank you, Jonathan Coppas. We appreciate you being here and uh, putting this presentation together. Of course, this is part of the FarmDoc Coronavirus and Ag series, part two. 
In fact, you are already signed up for it. We expect to see you again here on Friday of this week, and the series will continue on Tuesdays and Fridays. And thank you so much for taking your time for sp and spending it with us. On behalf of Jim Boltz, who's behind the uh, wheel today, making sure everything goes very well. We appreciate staying with us. I'm University of Illinois Extension's Tuck Leeson. You have a good day.